Indiana County District Attorney Bob Manzi is on the phone with us this morning. Our conversation brought to you by Marcus and Mack, a law firm representing injured people. Mr. D.A., good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing there? Oh, we're making it. We're making it. We're As long as we have some stories from Jack to get us through a day or two, then we can, <laughs> we can do that. Uh, I, and I'm sure it's not quite as exciting for you at the courthouse these days, but uh, let's talk a little bit about this. The Supreme Court, with its decision last week, that effectively closed the courts except for very specific instances, and obviously that would affect uh, the way that your district attorney's office operates too, would it not? Oh, absolutely. It has had a, a big impact on us uh, with the preliminary hearings at the district court level being stopped for the time being. Uh, the amount of cases that we're processing through is obviously much limited. Uh, we are still working on any uh, types of emergency cases here. Uh, the court is still operating for emergency PFAs for guardianships and, and situations like that. For my office, the court continues to work on uh, guilty pleas and sentencing arraignments wherein the defendant is incarcerated and we have the defendant appearing uh, via video from the various jails around the state. But the transport of prisoners uh, back and forth, uh, that's not happening right now? That is not happening. The, the inmates are not being transported to the courthouse. Yeah. Um, when you think about uh, term, your cases, of course, your case load, um, there was already a bit of a delay simply because of the transition to you as the new district attorney and uh, the state attorney general having to come on to some of those cases in which uh, uh, you would have a perceived conflict of interest. And so we talked about that the last time you were with us. Uh, this puts a further, a bit of a further delay on some of the really high profile cases, but really all of them, doesn't it? This will put a delay on just about every case. Uh, unless a defendant is entering a guilty plea over video or the sentencing is happening over video, everything else is being delayed at this point. So my office is taking the time right now to try to get ahead on as much as we can because once the courthouse effectively reopens to the public, we are going to have a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah, well, that was one of the things that I was thinking of was that uh, nobody wants this situation to occur as it has, but when it does occur as it has then uh, you have to take advantage of it and uh, find find a, a good angle on it that is really going to work to your benefit. That seems to be what you're doing. Yeah, I, I, looking at our April call list, which was moved until uh, right now the end of April, we're still working through that. I'm having uh, meetings with defense counsel over the telephone to try to work through all the cases that we're able to uh, to try to soften that impact. Talk, if you would, a little bit about some of the other ramifications of uh, the coronavirus uh, and the shutdown of businesses and, and many essential services uh, or non-essential services as well, and how that impacts your office in terms of investigations, uh, working with other authorities. Uh, I'm sure there are other impacts. Uh, there's a great deal of impacts. Obviously, if we have ongoing investigations and that involve businesses or involve people who are maybe not at work right now, those investigations are going to get slowed down. Uh, obviously, we need to protect everybody, including our law enforcement agencies. So, you know, the police are still on the front line. They're still standing ready, willing, and able to address any situation as necessary. But they're also taking the time to not have unnecessary contact with individuals in situations that can wait without hindering a case. Uh, we're still working with all of the police departments all of the police departments in our county are still operational, uh, still on full force. So, you know, we have that situation happening. Um, we're in contact with Alice Paul House, uh, who are still uh, ready to address any domestic violence needs, any victims' needs, uh, and CYS, who are obviously dealing with all the, the children's issues around our county. So there are some hindrances, but I will say with the various agencies and governmental offices, uh, I, th I think we're addressing them as best we can right now. Are there other bits of information the public really needs to know in order to uh, understand what's going on uh, with you and with their interactions with the district attorney's office? Well, the district attorney's office is still open. I'm here every day, uh, 8 to 4. So if anybody needs to be in touch with me, I'm available over email. I'm available by telephone, certainly to address any needs that are happening. Uh, we still are working with law enforcement. I, I think the biggest thing that, that we're asking is to you know, follow all the steps that are being put out there 
And one of the big concerns I have in the office, and we're trying to work on a way to, to get this message out, is as with any time there's a situation like this, unfortunately what it brings is situations of fraud or scam artists that are going to try to take advantage of individuals who are just inundated with information through various social media sites or, or less than reputable uh, avenues of the Internet. So we are working to still address our population to advise them of these scams and advise them to still be careful that, um, you know, there are going to be opportunities where people try to take advantage. Yeah, and, and that's a really big part of what you do. We think of uh, the district attorney's office, you and your predecessor, of course, uh, you both have a great concern for uh, protecting people and and maybe stopping the crime before it ever occurs, and uh, and that's what you're really addressing there. Uh, protection of senior citizens, protection of consumers, uh, and and the general populace. Uh, that has to be really, really important. Uh, and and so this hinders those efforts. You really do need to work extra hard to get that message out, don't you? We do, we do, and we appreciate assistance. Uh, you know, with your station and helping to get that message out. Our elder abuse task force will be meeting on Monday. Now, um, we had a meeting scheduled, and obviously we had to cancel the in-person version of the meeting due to everything happening. Uh, but we did continue it as a teleconference. So we're going to have a great deal of agencies and businesses from Miranda County on a teleconference on Monday to really brainstorm about what can we do to effectively message to our seniors about the various scams that are going to be uh, we anticipate happening that may be happening not only do we have the regular uh, defendants who might try to take advantage of our elderly but then we have scams that are going to come out because of this virus we have seen scams coming out because of the census uh, so we're really trying to uh, work together to still get that message out as best as we can. Yeah, in fact, we have a, an interview lined up with uh, State Police uh, Public Information Officer Trooper Clifford Greenfield. We're going to talk about scams and uh, how at this particular time they are really incipient. Um, uh, you're talking about Internet, uh, and you're talking about email scams, um, and that phone keeps ringing, doesn't it? <laughs> and you never know who's on the other end of it. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. It, 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 keeps, uh, it keeps ringing, and you know, we always advise seniors if it, um, you know, ask for things to come in the mail, ask for your family members to be in touch, uh, don't be giving out vital personal information to people unless you know who they are. Uh, and I know with Trooper Greenfield, he, he is a great resource for our county, and I'm sure he's going to be able to, to provide some great information in that avenue. Yeah, don't click on the link. That's <laughs> oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Just do not click on the link. Hey, while I have you on the line uh, today, uh, one of our more high-profile cases uh, wrapped up last week and in pretty quick form. That was the Todd Walters uh, case, that homicide case, uh, with, with a plea. Um, if you could, um, because I know so many people are so uh, interested in the way that that case has unfolded down through the years uh, and the, the various maneuvering within the court system, uh, comment on that, if you would, about um, how that all unfolded with the plea and uh, and uh, how we can we can think about that case now and, and maybe put it to bed a little bit. Sure. You know, obviously, uh, you know, that case took a great deal of time happening back in 2015. Uh, and our local police department did a fantastic job. Uh, Detective John Scherf was the affian on that. And, you know, in a very serious and emergency situation, they collaborated with a lot of law enforcement to locate Mr. Walters, who had fled the scene, and they uh, were able to find him in short course out in Altoona. Uh, during the course of the next few years, Mr. Walters was found competent and then found incompetent and kind of transferred back and forth a number of times. Uh, I've, I was actually called upon by the court back in 2017 and I served in, as counsel in one of the mental health hearings uh, as the uh, solicitor for county mental health in a competency hearing. So I was pretty in tune with the facts of the case. Uh, when I came into office, I knew that that case had been around for a number of years, and we had a March trial date. So way back in January, it was important to get that case ready for trial and, and 
get it taken care of because it had been around for a long period of time. Uh, and, and I believe that, you know, once I had everybody lined up for a trial and once we looked at that, Mr. Walters was competent at the time, and uh, he, he, through his counsel, indicated that he was looking to enter a plea. Uh, and in looking at the case, uh, what my office did is we were in contact with uh, Detective Sheriff and you know, with the other attorneys in the office to really take a look at the case to determine the, the most appropriate charge. Um, the case had been charged as a general count of homicide, which means uh, any level of murder or manslaughter, anywhere from first-degree murder, which necessitates evidence of premeditation, uh, all the way down to an involuntary manslaughter, which is a misdemeanor. Uh, and in looking at the case, we believe that the most appropriate charge was a third-degree murder because we didn't have evidence of uh, premeditation in that. Mm -hmm. um, so we took a great deal of time, I'd say since January. That was one of the many files that I take home at night and, and get through a whole lot of reports and, and comb through and make sure we're doing the appropriate thing, not only to protect our community, but to address the case appropriately. Um, and in advocating for a sentence in the matter, uh, it was important to me that there's a sentence that would essentially have Mr. Walters under supervision for the rest of his life. Uh, we have a sentence that the court uh, gave a tail on it of 40 years, which was the statutory maximum, meaning that Mr. Walters is effectively going to be under supervision of the state for the rest of his life. I don't know that it's considered appropriate whether a DA uh, comments on uh, the actions of a judge, but uh, for me, just watching the case from afar, Judge Martin has been really on top of this all all the way from the beginning, and uh, he's had a, he's had a really uh, good, solid hand on this case right from the start. So I don't know that you can compliment him, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, knowing in my experience being on the case as a solicitor for mental health back then, uh, I will say our court takes every case seriously, and, I, and I'm certain uh, Judge Martin spent a great deal of time uh, on this matter to take care of it appropriately. He is Indiana County District Attorney Bob Manzi. Anything else folks need to know about the way the court operates and uh, the way that uh, you're going to move forward from this point? Well, I think the way that, you know, the way that we're moving forward, obviously navigating our, our matter through the current situation is we're looking to invest in case earlies with local law enforcement to make sure that, you know, we're, we're investigating cases to the best of our ability, that we're all working together. It was very nice that I heard just the other day from law enforcement that, they feel that right now, and maybe it's this emergency situation, um, they, they feel like there's a lot more communication than they've seen historically. So I'm happy to hear that. Um, I, I'm very proud of the law enforcement out there throughout our county. And we're going to be looking to work together to stand up for victims and stand up for the people in our county. So uh, I, I look forward to a lot more cases that are, are brought to an end, whether that comes through a plea to the lead charge or whether that comes through a child, and, and we stand ready to stand up for victims here. Very good. Appreciate your time this morning. As always, I appreciate what you do there. He's uh, District Attorney Bob Manzi with us here this morning on The Voice of Indiana County, WCCS, AM 1160 and 101.1 FM.